it's now my pleasure to introduce our next session, Ethnography and Retinoblastoma. And this will be uh, run by Helen Damaris, uh, who is a scientist at Sick Kids uh, in Toronto and also on the World Eye Cancer Hope Board in Canada. And Cleonia Colbert Dorsey, um, who most of you heard from earlier and is a retinoblastoma survivor um, and warrior. If you have questions during, uh, this is going to be a very informal um, presentation where we, we encourage questions to be put in the Q&A portal during um, the presentation and Emily will uh, will pull out any questions and let Helen and Cleonia know. So here we go, Helen. Great, <laughs> go thank it. you so much, Marissa. And hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here once again at the One Retinoblastoma World Conference. Um, when Marissa and Cleonia approached me about this panel, I was very intrigued by the opportunity to start this discussion in this area. But I have to make one disclaimer, though. It's not my area of expertise. Um, ethnography, in particular, as a scientific um, uh, field, is comes more from the social sciences and anthropology. And I'm uh, trained in the molecular sciences. So ethnography essentially is the scientific description of the customs of individual peoples and cultures. And you can think of these peoples and cultures traditionally um, in terms of the societies we live in, our customs, um, the, the race we belong to, ethnicity or other factors, but it could also even be our retinoblastoma culture or this retinoblastoma family we're describing here. And so we can really think of it in a number of different ways. Um, for myself, um, having that background in molecular and medical genetics, it's always made me wonder if we've adequately looked at representative biological samples, even of all these groups. Um, do we really know for certain how all the ways that retinoblastoma can develop and progress? Um, as we heard from Andrew Blakey's talk today, we have a one-sidedness even in how we describe medical terms and what we've um, discovered as being the norm. And um, this translates down into how we teach our medical doctors and what we think is standard. And so even when we talk about patient experiences, what is standard? Do we actually know? It's not actually a one size fits all as we're hearing. And so with um, in my own research, I am learning to recognize more about patient experiences as an alternate form of knowledge beyond that, that can be found in medical and scientific texts. So I have to say being here at this conference is really expanding my mind and teaching me a lot. And thank you to all the survivors and family members who have shared their stories. I've, I'm learning a lot. Um, and now I'd like to turn the mic over to Cleonia to tell us a little bit about her interest in this area, um, what created this area, why she feels it's important, and uh, to tell us a little bit about um, her, her, her side of things. So Cleonia? Thank you so much, Helen, and it's good to be able to address this great conference again this afternoon. I've got to give full disclaimer, just as Helen did, that this is not my area of expertise either. Um, I actually had the opportunity to meet Helen when the conference was held in D.C., and I consider myself very fortunate that, uh, as you heard me say in my presentation earlier, once you connect in this conference, to some degree, it does feel like a village. You create bonds. And, and so we've had opportunity to dialogue along with Sandra and along with Marissa. And as we were thinking about planning for this year's conference, I just started thinking about why or why not, or what if, particularly as an African-American woman. And I just started wondering about perhaps what are uh, expectations, or circumstances that persons and other um, ethnic groups face. And so it just became an area that we started to discuss and Helen was interested and Marissa was interested. So uh, Helen and I have been talking and we just want this conversation to sort of evolve organically and hopefully all of you in the office, in the office, hopefully all of you in the audience it feels like a work day kind of, doesn't it? Because we've really been in, involved and engaged at such a high level. But hopefully those of you in the office, oh, I said it again, in the audience, will have questions um, for us. If you know my story, then you, you've heard me say that I was the only person when I was diagnosed, blah, blah, years ago. 
I don't want to give away my age. Um, I was the only person in my family to be diagnosed at the time. And to date, I am the only person in my family um, to have ever been diagnosed. And until I went to that conference in 2017, I'd never met anybody who had uh, retinal blastoma. I never considered the broad spectrum of the disease or what it represented until at the age of 29, I found myself pregnant with my first child. And then that opens up a whole nother world of possibilities because you start to wonder what might this mean for the child that, um, that I am carrying. Um, at the time of my pregnancy, I then began doing a lot of investigation and I was lucky that I had a very good and supportive um, obstetrician who referred me to genetic counseling. But in some of the research that I did, um, I found quite a few pieces of literature that talked about the maturity of retinoblastoma children. And it was attributed to our engagement with various medical professions or the fact that we have to undergo um, high level of treatment and there are conversations that are occurring with us being present. Um, and so for me, I do believe that I matured at an early age. Um, I was considered very studious and that was not only encouraged but expected by my family. Um, my mother promoted a love of books and a love of reading. And I don't know if she did that perhaps because she knew that I perhaps may have visual challenges. So I remember at the age of three or four, she enrolled me in book clubs so that books were being delivered to my house. And I actually read at a very young age. Um, in speaking of my mother, and as we have heard many person share, not only during the context of, of this weekend's conference, but uh, conversations that I've had with other survivors. I've been talking to quite a few people this past week about the conference coming up. My mother, and it seems like many mothers, are the ones who identify and champion diagnosis in their children who have retinoblastoma. And that was that was my case. My mom saw the glow. She knew something was different, even though she went to various medical professionals who continued to tell her there was nothing wrong. Um, she continued to seek a, a diagnosis. Eventually, she was referred to John Hopkins University uh, because we live in Maryland. And from the exposure at Hopkins, it was determined that I'd better be treated at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, so I don't know. I'll stop at that particular point, Helen, and see if that triggers any thought processes. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Sure. I'm curious to know, um, you know, just speaking about our own cultural backgrounds, my cultural background is Greek, and I know many Greeks have an issue with the word cancer, so much mm. so that we don't call it by its name. We have another word for it, so we don't have to say it, and then maybe it bring on more bad luck, or it makes it real. Um, and I've often wondered how, um, if you know, if we're making assumptions about how all our families from different groups handle that word. And I'm wondering, was it your family's experience that that was a bad word, um, or was it the classic American experience where that was uh, something they were familiar with? That's a great question. And I can give you the perspective from my family as uh, well as I was talking to another survivor earlier um, in the week um, who is of the Latinx um, population. And our stories are somewhat similar. In my family, for as, far, for as far back as I can remember, for African Americans, it seemed to be a dirty secret. Cancer was a word that you didn't use, you didn't share. If someone had cancer, it was talked about in hushed tones. And with the older members of our family, that still pretty much seems to be the case too. I don't know why, almost to some degree as if it's a curse um, or just something that if you speak it out loud, I know in some religious circles, there is a belief 
that you don't speak things into existence. So by giving voice and by giving power and by giving volume to a situation, there's a belief that that puts things in the aura and in the atmosphere that creates um, them to go further. But um, Marissa was kind enough to introduce me to um, a young lady in California who's been very instrumental in engaging members of the Latin um, community um, who have been affected by retinoblastoma. And her name is, it's Maria, it'll come to me. But that's one of the things that she particularly shared with me. Um, and I wanna get her words kind of verbatim. She says that in her family, they did not talk about cancer because they believed that it was God's punishment for any wrongdoing. She is a RB mom. Her son lost his eye to RB. And so she said, even though she knew that that was a very prolific feeling in her family, she never gave credence to that fact. And I guess for me, I wonder, and this is part of my interest in this area of discussion, what do we see other cultural, racial, ethnic diagnosis groups identify with as challenges or as areas where we need to explore further? And, and what do you think the role of the healthcare professional or even research teams should be around their care around these issues? Um, you know, some people might be speaking to families unaware of some of these um, issues. How do we uncover these and, and make sure our care is personalized around these issues? Absolutely. There's actually, this is another interesting um, a conversation. I was in an ACCME, um, American Council for Continuing Med Medical Education Conference last week with what we are seeing here in the US, which is a higher awakening to the fact that there are disparities that exist um, in, in equality of, of healthcare and of a lack of cultural understandings, uh, there is emphasis in trying to create greater awareness and trying to promote educational programs that look at culture and identity and how healthcare practitioners can address those needs. Sandra and I have been talking this week. I don't know if Sandra wants to unmute herself, but Sandra and I have been talking this week about some of the challenges that she has seen with uh, families from different groups and how it's very much incumbent upon the healthcare provider to uh, develop that, that cultural acumen um, to be able to, to work more effectively with, with families. Yeah. Um, I'm just so pleased that we're having this discussion um, in, in this context. And when I started emailing with, um, uh, with Cleonia, all these examples cropped in my mind, situations where I hadn't actually thought about it at that time, because, you know, as the clinician, you know, you have game face on, you know, I talk about this all the time. When I'm at the hospital is when I'm not thinking about anything other than getting this child, this family through their appointment or their operating session for the day. And it's only afterwards that you have time. And it's usually at the 1RB world where I, the game face I've got on is I'm just thinking about RB as a more general or more holistically. And, you know, where I live, you know, we have a very strong migrant population from all over the world. So we are like a miniature world. And I have had the privilege of um, walking with families from many different um, ethnicities and cultures. And um, if I can, if I can describe, you know, some of the different situations that I've experienced where we've had a child, you know, say Northern European, or Australian, they come big with both parents usually, and we give the information that their child's diagnosis and it's all very distressing as it, as it would and should be. Um, and then I've had the instance where it's a, a more extended family. And I have one particular memory of a beautiful little girl 
Sudanese family and the, she, the family came with this entourage of 10 or 12 people and everybody wanted to sit in and listen because there was the mother and the father and the auntie and the uncle and the person that spoke English better and the neighbour and and this support work was incredible. And from our perspective, we're like, well, we don't have a room big enough that fits all these people. But all these people were absolutely critical for this family to take on the information and cope with the information and make a decision that is right for their child, for their family. We have um, interactions with families where the decision is almost taken away from the parents um, and it's culturally it's with the elders and especially when you're talking about you know enucleating an eye um, and we're like well, we don't really have a lot of time for you to get in touch with your elders and for them to stew on it because we're looking at you know we're still trying to save your child's life we don't have that luxury I have another experience of a family where the father was desperate for the artificial eye to be put in place because he still hadn't told his family overseas of the child's diagnosis. And, and this is getting back to the can't possibly um, tell my family that, you know, we've been struck by cancer. And this same father, I saw him a few months back and he said, oh, I had to tell my daughter that she had cancer and she cried for days and she was eight and she had no idea. Um, and again, this is very cultural. You know, I come back, I come from an Italian background and I get exactly what Helen was saying that you, know, you just do not utter those words. And what we, what, what well, well, certainly um, what people will say is they won't even say the word cancer. The, the words they use translate as that terrible disease. Um, I don't know what might be sitting in Greek, but, you know, that's what it's, that terrible disease. And don't even utter the word lest it be visited upon you, you know. Um, so my experiences are really varied. And, and I have this started thinking, so when I take a history and meet a family for the first time, I really do, even though we record what the ethnicity is, we're just checking a box rather than thinking and asking the question, how does this sit with you in your culture? What are the things that we need to be mindful of in, that to address and um, acknowledge how your culture will deal with this sort of a diagnosis and treatment going forward? Um, because especially now in the COVID pandemic, you know, I'm having to advocate really strongly to allow both parents set foot in the hospital um, let alone an entourage of 10 people. So, you know, they're just some of my reflections if the, for what they're worth anyway. Thank you, Sandra. I also want to remind the audience that um, we'd be happy to hear from you if you have anything that resonates here. I know we have representation from so many countries just looking at the attendee list. Um, if you could think and reflect about instances in your experience where you would have wished there would have been a little bit more um, cultural safety practiced uh, in, in the hospitals you visited or um, examples from uh, around the world that we might not have addressed here, please put them in the chat or the Q&A um, and, and we can unmute you to join the discussion. Um, so for myself as a researcher, I'm, I'm really also, oh, there's a little chat there. You can also raise your hand to, to speak. Thanks, uh, Jen. So for me as a researcher, I'm, one of the big challenges is um, the importance of engaging this diverse patient population and sharing their voices. We know that retinoblastoma pretty much affects um, the world's population equivalently. And yet in our research studies, um, not just for retinoblastoma, for all sorts of research, the voices represented are generally middle-class, white, Caucasian, Sometimes that's a, an issue globally because you know science tends to favor that produced in North America. Um, we don't see a lot of um, African publications, although the science is great. We don't see those in our journals because of a, of a bias, whether conscious or unconscious. But even in my own research in Canada, I'm finding it difficult to get the diversity um, in, 
in research participation. And I'd imagine also in, in sharing these kinds of experiences, we're, we're not getting that diversity. So why is that? What, um, what do you think is an issue there? Do you know? <laughs> that too, quite frankly, Helen is a question for me. So not only when it comes to research, but I also think at the level of engagement, um, when we were in DC, I was there as an African-American woman. Then there was Thomas Reed, who some of you may be familiar uh, with. He's been involved with We See Hope and he's very active on the East Coast um, in terms of being an advocate and, and really communicating about uh, RB in the community. It was he, his wife, his two daughters, one of his daughters had a retinoblastoma diagnosis also. In terms of African-American representation, African-American representation, we were the only five people there. And as I've continued to engage in these conferences, I still don't see a lot of African-Americans there. So that's one of my questions in terms of having an interest in this area. Does it speak to the cultural taboo that uh, having cancer is a curse or is it that there's not enough outreach or knowledge or diversity seen at the level where African-Americans or others can feel like they engage. I'm going back over my notes. Um, it's Maria Isabel Espinosa uh, was Marissa's um, referral from California. One of the comments that she made is that in the Hispanic culture, if one receives a cancer diagnosis, their mindset automatically goes to the possibilities of racial discrimination when they are seeking treatment. Um, and the fear that that's something that they don't want to have to um, undergo necessarily. So I don't know. I don't have the answers. And I think that that's why this discussion is so critically important when we've got a broad range of perspectives before us. You, you, you're, you're getting on the right topics. You know, in preparation for this discussion, I did a little bit of digging in the literature to see what is known about ethno-racial disparities in retinoblastoma in particular. There's not a lot of research there, but one study from about six years ago looked at um, an American cancer database and did see that the Hispanic population in particular in the U.S. has worse outcomes um, than so any nice, other yes. group. Yeah. And is more likely to, you know, because of their more advanced disease, most likely to have an enucleation as well. So um, these are obviously the things we're talking about in terms of culture, they're intersecting with structural barriers and access to care um, and, 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 you know, structural racism as well at various levels. Um, but this could influence how a family perceives um, research, you know, if you're, if you're being discriminated against at the healthcare level, um, perhaps you wouldn't want to also participate in sharing your story or, um, you know, you, you might be um, feeling what's, what, what will I get out of it? I don't know. This is just where I'm thinking. I may be totally wrong. <laughs> These are provocative things to talk about, um, but, but important to, to touch on, I think. Yeah. And I guess related to what you're saying, Helen, it, it could also be the journey of retinoblastoma is so personal. As a survivor, and maybe this is just me, I feel that it's one of the only cancers where you don't necessarily get over it. You think about a mastectomy patient um, or one who's needed to have a limb amputation because of some other form of cancer. In my mind, I feel like it's, you get the treatment and you're done. Hopefully there aren't recurrent cancers. But with those of us in the retinoblastoma community, you know that there's always those six month appointments to the oculars. You know that every couple of years you're having to get a new prosthesis. You know that there is the possibility of lid surgery um, throughout the rest of your lifetime. And it feels like we're never really over it. So at times that can be a very heavy burden. It's an added level of stress and perhaps 
there's a lack of comfort or acceptance in wanting to talk about it. But I think that it is incumbent upon us, particularly those of us who consider ourselves thriving to help champion uh, the narrative and try to create higher levels of acceptance around this very rare cancer. We have a few interesting comments in the chat section. So Michelle writes that her mom, who was also an RB survivor, rarely ever said the word cancer. And when talking with doctors, the phrasing was always an eye condition. Mm -hmm. And Lori comments that she's experienced something similar where older people wouldn't say the word cancer or speak about retinoblastoma. And she's also writes her father's brother had unilateral retinoblastoma, but when my, her son was diagnosed in 2003 was the first time she heard the word. Thank you for that. I, I'm going to pose a question to the audience in case there's some clinicians there. I'm wondering how you'd adapt your, your counseling practices um, or your discussions with families based on these um, issues uh, people might have with the terms we use. Um, have you considered um, how you might help the families and do you have any tips and techniques? Uh, I was reading a, an article from the broader pediatric oncology um, literature where they really looked at the use of the word resilience. And resilience is something, um, you know, Cleona, you, you really touched on it as well with all your inspiring talks. We, we see it as a positive term, but in this patient's experience, and I can't remember what um, cancer it was, the term resilience um, distanced the family from what they were experiencing because they weren't given enough time. Hearing that, you know, be resilient all the time during treatment helped that made them feel a little bit like they couldn't just feel what they were feeling now. That's not quite persevering yet. Um, they needed that that moment. It was, it's an interesting study how terms can really, even when they're well-meaning or ways the clinical team um, engages with families might have some um, all, you know, less than, than optimal effects. I'm curious to know what um, the clinicians would say about that. But as they're thinking, um, Cleonia, I wonder, there are some people who cope really well. Um, like you said, you know, retinoblastoma is something you have for your whole life. You're here in the community sharing your experience. Some people might want to kind of forget that it exists and they cope by avoiding. How do we, you know, it is still important, I think, from my perspective, it's still important to engage these people. It's even that perspective is an important one to have, but how do we engage people who don't want to engage? <laughs> is that a lost cause? That's a good question. I'm sitting here and I'm reflecting and I'm looking at the comments in the chat. And in all honesty, I, for the longest time, didn't want to embrace the word or the fact that I was a cancer survivor. So when people would ask me, oh, what's wrong with your eye? I would do everything under the sun to avoid the fact that I had to tell people that I had cancer. Um, connecting and finding survivors, as I've said earlier today, is what empowered me. And I think that I found the Facebook group first. And I believe on Friday night, somebody talked about finding the online resources. Um, it was quite by accident that I found that resource. Um, I have even thought or said I would like to see, this conference is wonderful. Um, but I think about Little People of America that every year they have an annual week-long conference that brings together the Little People community to engage with those on the same journey and to meet people who have had the same experiences. I would almost like to see us be able to perhaps try to do something like that, where there's a concerted effort to bring together retinoblastoma families, survivors more consistently, because I think that there's power in numbers. And when you see what other families, what other survivors are able to do and achieve, 
it is empowering and enriching to those who are seeking similar experiences or did not know that similar experiences were possible. We have a hand up uh, from Pernil. She wants to ask her question or, or give us her expertise maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Hi Pernil. Hi, good, good to see you. Yes, I was just thinking about your comment, uh, Helen, and good to see all of you again. As, uh, as uh, late as yesterday, last night, we discussed in the, um, in the breakout rooms how we as physicians can feel that there could be benefits from reaching out and connecting to other RB survivors. But in a recent study that I will present later tonight, we didn't feel that uh, we didn't find that need as big as we felt. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think what you said, Helen, about many survivors um, are trying to forget it. They don't want to it to take center stage of their life. One of the survivors um, said it in those words. They want to be normal, live normal lives. However. Uh, I do think that many could benefit from it, uh, but I find it difficult to reach out and make seminars for survivors without medicalizing them uh, unnecessarily, without putting a label on them that they don't want. So I feel that my role is uh, I need to be very delicate in not doing this, not forcing it to them. So that's one comment, and I would like to hear what, what your thoughts are on these, how to, uh, how to uh, do this in a delicate way. And then one single comment, uh, because while I raised my hand, you had a very nice comment, Clayona, on uh, Little People of America, because I see many rare conditions. And one of my specialties uh, besides RB is uh, rare, skeletal, rare skeletal dysplasia which includes dwarfism, as they call it in Denmark. They prefer to call it like that themselves. I do attend their yearly meetings. They have extremely benefits from meeting both small, small children and adults, each other, and sharing their experiences, sharing their difficulties. Um, and I, I've been thinking about the differences, and I can't pinpoint them exactly, but there obviously are differences. But I also meet people with dwarfism that are not interested in meeting others because they don't have the need. So I think my, um, my approach is to really be careful about individual needs, individ individual uh, views on human lives, uh, individual perspectives, and then try to address that. But it's, it's difficult. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for now. Thank you. We have a couple of Q&As in the box. So one of them is, would any clinicians consider to share their current practices for learning about and make space for a family culture in the retinoblastoma treatment pathway? I think Pernil touched on the importance of individualizing. Um, I think, Cleonia, did you have a comment to what Pernil had said? No, just... Uh to piggyback what Pernell said, I think that you do have to meet people where they are um, and take that into consideration. Using myself as an example, there certainly was a time in my life where I would not have wanted to address that I was a retinoblastoma survivor. You would not have found me freely speaking about it as I do today. So I had to get to a point of acceptance um, now that I have accepted it and as a survivor, I feel that there's a certain level of freedom when you walk in the truth of what you've endured and what you've experienced. Um, I'm seeing great discussion in the chat where people yeah. are sharing their stories and kind of talking about, um, Larry, who presented earlier, says he just feels that it's important that we continue to be a voice and to make connections. I think that that's where it starts. 
I agree with you. Um, I liked how you put it. Some may not be paying attention, but they will be listening. So, you know, you don't have to force it down anyone's throat, but we're here for when they're yes. ready. Yeah, that's great. Um, we have another question. It's an anonymous question in the Q&A. I've certainly noticed cultural taboo in my practice and as an ophthalmologist. I have been faced with the task of explaining the cancer diagnosis to a teenage boy while he broke down about his cancer diagnosis or a mother of a child with bilateral RB who was made to believe her eye was enucleated from trauma as a child. I sadly know a mother whose concerns about their child's eyes were dismissed by healthcare workers mm -hmm. and perceived that their lack of knowledge of good English was the barrier. A question for the panel, while being conscious of a child's ethnicity prior to discussions with the family, I wonder if and how we present ourselves from crossing over to racial bias. Yeah, you, you can never really be conscious of a child's ethnicity really it's it's essentially a self-report so they have to tell you you can't make an assumption um I, i'm not sure uh, sandra do you have an answer to this is that why your hands up um no and oh. i was trying to remember why i put my hand up too oh that's right i've just that that's a really good point and it is a very difficult line to not have a, um, to not meet the family and make a presumption. I mean, sometimes our medical record will tell us um, what their ethnicity is, or you can tell by their surname, it's the trigger that, okay, this family, you know, it, there may be some uh, ethnic or cultural background that's not sort of Northern European or Aussie, as it were. Um, so it is very difficult to to not be biased or that the way you are approaching it, that it be interpreted as bias. Um, but what I was gonna say was touching on what Penilla was talking about, how do we reach people? And, and I think Cleonia mentioned it as well. How do we get this information out to people who don't want to talk about it? And I've been thinking about that for a while now with my RB families where at diagnosis, I say, you know, would you like to talk to other families that have been in your shoes and uh, have walked the path you are about to walk, walk through and help it, that might help them make the decision of what treatment they will choose. And they'll say, yes, yes, yes. And I'll get the phone number and everything. And I'll call the other family and say, are you happy for me to give the number to provide support? Yes, 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 we are. And then the family I thought I would put them in touch with will call me and say, oh, they never rang me. Is everything okay? And I'll say, well, okay, they didn't ring you. Ring you. Then obviously they didn't feel comfortable in doing that. Um, and what happens, I think, is parents are worried about crying over the phone or becoming distressed. Um, and I, I think, is there another way that we can provide support? And, you know, we're videoing all these conference discussions and perhaps that's a safer way to be part of a community without really being present. They can engage with the information without having to be visible um, that's just an idea that I have. Um, and then once they get a taste for what it's all about and a taste of what benefit they can get from being part of a community as much or as little as they want to, then maybe that's the stepping stone. If, am I making sense? I don't know. It's still too early in the morning here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Certainly, definitely. Um, just in the interest oh. yep oh I'm sorry go ahead uh, um I noticed I think Emily you were going to say the same thing about the other question well we have a hand raise Vera has her hand raised oh she please come Vera on. yes ask a question Hello. hi Vera We can hear you a little scrambled. Please, can you hear me? Yes, okay. we can. Okay, I'm sorry I'm on the road, but I hope I can. 
So I think I, I want to comment on the culture, it's the management of our patient. My experience in Ghana is that there are some cultures that tend to use the term cancer. We have local names for it. They don't want to use that. And once you mention it, it equates us to a death sentence of some sort. Or the fact that the of the body is going to be taken away. Please, can you still hear me? So it's a bit difficult sometimes communicating. And the system is also such that even when you are dealing with a couple, maybe the parent, they still want to go back to their extended family to go and discuss you before they come back. And that, the, I mean, the, and the parents alone in some cultures cannot take the decision. So they will have to go back and sometimes that delay their treatment. The other problem is that usually the woman will come with the children, but the woman cannot take the decision alone. So after you explain and all that, even when she agrees, she would have to go back and talk to the husband. And the husband says, no, that is it. Religion plays a significant role in our part of the world. Sometimes I've had to appeal to the church leaders or the imam of some of my clients for them to intervene for a, a particular child to be brought back to the hospital so that we can manage the these children. And these are issues where um, it has to be already late, but they cannot they will not allow you to proceed with that because of some of the cultural beliefs and the religious inclination. And I don't know how Thanks, Vera. I'm not sure we caught all of that, but I think we got the gist that um, oftentimes, you know, it, it, in Ghana, where you practice and live, there's um, issues to deal with who makes the decisions in the family. The mother is the one who comes in the clinic, but must relay the information to the father at home or extended family. And that could cause significant delay or even miscommunication, I'd imagine, or maybe changing of an important clinical decision and religion also being uh, important. Thank you for sharing those. It, sometimes we, we tend to focus on the clinical and the medical and knowing exactly what to do in the operating room, but these kinds of factors could interfere with that perfect clinical outcome if we don't figure out how to address them in a way that um, supports the families as well as the child's well-being in a timely manner. So we have one more question in the chat box for the Great. clinicians. Thoughts on how do you navigate when the RB child gets older and starts to have different views or opinions than their parents? For example, if when the child gets older and wants to talk about their diagnosis, share their story, meet other survivors, but the parents are more in the place of not talking about it or mentioning it, how do you manage that conflict and balance the needs of both parties? That's a great question. And I'll also ask um, any survivors, like I know Michelle had uh, indicated how her mom's approach was different. Maybe Michelle can share how she's um, gotten in, involved in the RB community as she's grown up or anyone else? Cleonia, do you have any answer there? Um, I think my parents always allowed me to take the lead. Um, and still to this day, they do. I think both my mother and father are amazed that I have become the advocate that I am. Um, and I'm just thankful that they support me and however I choose to tell my story. And that's a theme that's come up that as survivors, it's our story. And I think once we reach a certain age, it being our story should also mean that we are allowed to delve whatever path is going to create a higher level of healing for ourselves. 
Lisa writes in the chat that she thinks child life has a really big role in helping yes. families understand and giving them space to process. Definitely. Great. There's a lot more comments from Mary, Genevieve, Lori, Lynn. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for sharing. Um, I guess we'll wrap up here and I'd like to thank you Cleonia for being um, the inspiration behind this panel, getting me thinking, um, definitely have my thinking cap on as to how some of these more anthropological questions can be incorporated into my research to um, help uh, modify practice in a sustainable way. Um, thanks everyone, Sandra, Pernil, Vera for your, um, for your input, everyone on the chat as well. I'd say let's just keep the dialogue going. Thank you for being receptive to it, Helen. And in future 1RB World Conferences, perhaps we can continue to have uh, discussions such as this. I think so. And I think my big takeaway is I want to find an anthropologist who wants to work with us. I'm, I know I'm being a nerdy scientist, but <laughs> I think that's the way to go. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for your input. Thank you.